What happens when you're the most well-funded, well-skilled, and resourced tech company in the world and you still have legacy systems you can't protect? Might be time for a glass of OJ. Well, Microsoft's not been having a fun time for the past few months. Um, as you can see in a link down in the doobly-doo, uh, Microsoft is just last week informed the world that they have been the victim of yet another cyber attack. Yes, uh, Microsoft has been hit by uh, several people over the past few years. Um, one just back in August, uh, I think, was, um, I believe, Storm558 uh, was stealing um, an, a corporate account that led to some Azure breaches. Uh, I know in the past they've also had something involved with, uh, you know, code signing keys, certificates, um, have been stolen a few times. And then uh, they also had um, Nobelium was targeting some delegated administrative privileges uh, back in 2021. Uh, it just kind of keeps coming from Microsoft. Uh, so much so that last year around August when they had their uh, issue in Azure, uh, Congress, several senators and, and people in the House, regardless of what you <laughs> you have your politics as, um, you know, people were very displeased in saying, you know, look, you know, your position and how much money we're giving you for defense and and everything else, you're you need to consider your position. Uh, you know, we're trusting you with all this information. Uh, are you really the folks we should be trusting? Uh, you don't seem to be able to keep this stuff protected. Um, and we're going to talk about how well-funded Microsoft is, uh, and the level of skill they should have. Um, but you know, Microsoft is released, a released a statement that really does take a bit of a self critical, uh, examination of themselves. Uh, and, and I'm going to just kind of take a few takeaways from that to hopefully give you uh, to kind of consider what that means for you, but also just kind of broader what it means for information security community, uh, especially as Microsoft is a major part of that. We <laughs> trust them with Exchange and Azure Identities and, uh, you know, compute and storage and, and very soon, uh, I mean, already, but very soon AI. Uh, how much can we really trust Microsoft uh, in, in this? <laughs> But essentially what happened with this latest uh, attack is Nobelium uh, was able to uh, compromise a Microsoft legacy system uh, via password spray. So this probably ought to be a concept video uh, and probably is getting added as a uh, concept video idea. Uh, but the different types of cyber attacks that exist from an authentication standpoint. Uh, and in this case, when you're wanting to take over someone's account, there are many ways to do it. But one of the ways is just to brute force. Uh, we're just going to guess passwords. Uh, and some of them can be really raw, as in if it's a 12 character password, we're going to start with 12 lowercase a's and then 11 lowercase a's and a lowercase b and so on and so forth with uppercase and special characters and numbers. Okay, that's going to take forever, right? Uh, so that's there's just, even with computers doing millions of processes a second, there's just no way you're going to be able to truly get that taken care of in a, in a reasonable amount of time. It's going to be loud, it's going to be noisy, and someone's going to catch that. That wasn't in play here. It wasn't even credential stuffing where you take known passwords that have been compromised uh, at, you know, from a company or from a group of users or even just one user. And you're just going to say, hey, you've been compromised over at Twitter uh, for using this password. We're going to use that password for this account. Oh, look at that. You reused your password. So we're in now. That's credential stuffing. No, no, no. This was even worse. This was even worse. This was just password spraying where I'm going to take one password and I'm going to try it against all of these accounts and I'm going to find if just one of them was set with that password. A lot of times uh, the classics examples is things like, uh, you know, winter 2024 bang uh, or something like that. You know, it's got you can have an uppercase, a lowercase. It satisfies pa password complexity, uh, lengths even, because winter is like five, 2024 is four, and then you've got the uh, bank. So that's 10. It's a 10-character password. 
you know, kind of long for a lot of people. Um, and they could even add some other things. But anyway, so you would try that across. And then maybe in the spring, you might say spring 2024. Uh, bang, I know I just ruined a lot of people's passwords out there just now. But that's how bad this was. Not saying that that was the password was used, but what it was is they used probably a few passwords maybe they've seen before Microsoft using, and they just chose one password and applied them to all the different accounts out there. So it was a password spray. And I'm thinking it was a password spray. Now, why would just a password spray get you in there? Because even if you... Even if you were able to you know, get someone's password, surely they would have had to go through multi-factor, right? Right? Hey, folks, it was a legacy system. To which I say it's 2024. How old does a system have to be to be considered legacy to the point where it's not compatible with any form of multi-factor authentication and... You can't wrap any kind of multi-factor around it and you're Microsoft and it's your own source code and it's your own platform and you can't even do that. How old does that have to be? Did this go back to like Windows, you know, NT or, or before, or goodness, even something like Windows 3.1 and, you know, there's just no hope that you're going to be able to wrap something around that. I don't think it was that. I don't think, you know, maybe this was something from the realm of Windows 2008 even back then, I have a hard time thinking that there's not a way they could have wrapped two-factor authentication around that platform in some way to protect their own platform that is theirs that they use for their own purposes. Now, this was a non-production environment, thank goodness. Uh, and it wasn't a company, uh, uh, a, a customer environment. It doesn't sound like it had connections in any client environments, but it did have connections into Microsoft production environments that they use themselves. Um, and so they were able to use portions of the identities in, that they had compromised and other, other parts of the infrastructure they had compromised and were able to then pivot into uh, the non-legacy systems inside the back ends of Microsoft. Uh, and they compromised email accounts of executives and specifically based on what they know was stolen uh, because information was stolen, uh, it looks like they were targeting information about them. And as a nation state, uh, <laughs> you, you need to gather intelligence on what your enemies have on you. <laughs> and Microsoft, of course, uh, is going to be the enemy of a uh, nation like Russia or even China. Uh, as, and they're going to try to steal information from them about their own activities. Hey, what do we need to burn? Uh, what do we need to stop doing? Uh, what aren't they aware of yet? Uh, what, what zero days haven't we burned with them yet that they're not aware of? Uh, and who knows what other information they could be looking at? Um, what, what other campaigns and activities do they seem to be aware of? Do they know where we're at in their infrastructure elsewhere? <laughs> do they know, uh, not just, you know, in their back ends, but also just, do they know what Azure machines we're still using and a part of? Have they identified those yet? Um, you can imagine Microsoft knows threat actors like these use their infrastructure as a service, uh, services, uh, and sometimes allow them to continue for a little bit because they want the intelligence off that. Uh, so maybe they were trying to figure out what all do they know? Do they have that kind of information on us? And, uh, you know, once again, this was, uh, Microsoft seemed to have detected this back in November uh, and is just now releasing information about it. So uh, this was also something that I think they released under the 8K filing with the SEC. Now, the SEC new rules didn't come into effect until like mid or end of December. So it's going to be interesting to see why they needed to release anything <laughs> um, because technically the breach was before the requirements uh, took effect, but they did. And it'd be interesting to see, did they somehow get a national security um, consideration? Because uh, you can get that at the SEC. You can say, hey, actually, we know there's an issue here, but uh, 
yeah, we're gonna we're, we're gonna call national security on this because we're Microsoft and we we support a lot of national security stuff. So we're just gonna say, you know, in the sake for the sake of just finding out what we don't know right now about the attack, we need more time before we can uh, before we, it'd be interesting to see if they uh, actually did get that. Also in the statement, and it's not a long statement. They make a couple mentions about you know this being a nation state actor and i find there's only a couple reasons why companies make mention of like an attribution like oh this was a nation state um usually what they're trying to do is they're trying to say how difficult it was to get into the environment because this is the skill level of the group who got in this wasn't a script kitty, right? This wasn't someone who just copy and pasted some code, pointed it at one of our IPs and got lucky, uh, or just simply got in. Um, this also isn't a cyber criminal who, uh, you know, maybe had some malware that was really advanced and new, and they just were trying it out on us and it worked. Um, this is a nation state. These people have the money, they have the skills, they have the motivation, and they have all the time in the world to spend on us. So of course they were going to get in at some point. Okay. And uh, how difficult, though, was it really to get into your environment? Did it require nation state level difficulty to get, to get in? Did it really require a lot of funding, a lot of skill, a lot of motivation, and a lot of time to get into your environment? Um, and from what we know about this attack, just the limited details Microsoft has given so far, and I expect uh, like some of their past reports, they're going to give us more information at some point. This wasn't nation state level activity. I imagine they spent probably months trying to get in, probably because they were maybe slowly password spraying, not to arouse any suspicion. Um, but, you know, once they're in, maybe they were also a little slow. You know, they're going to take their time. They're going to watch, observe, and just take their time walking through and finally getting to the target they want. Okay, fine. But did it really take that amount of skill to get in? It really didn't. Um, so was this nation was this a nation state style attack? Except for the fact that it was taken, uh, ta uh, the actions were taken by a nation state. It wasn't really. It sounds like it's maybe mid to low end cyber criminal uh, type of an attack. Um, which, what does that say about Microsoft? Uh, you know, if you're Microsoft and you're saying, oh, this was a nation state, uh, that's not necessarily the excuse it is for, let's say, a company that only makes $500 million in a year revenue. Uh, because when you're Microsoft and you are making billions of dollars in profit, um, really what it says is Microsoft were you not highly motivated? Were you not highly skilled? Were you not highly resourced and funded? And were you not given an abundant amount of time to take care of these legacy environments? Again, how legacy do we have to go back? And you still haven't somehow secured that. Someone's not motivated, funded, skilled, or think they have enough time to take care of these things, right? Uh, and so, you know, really when you're Microsoft and you're trying to, I don't know if they're trying to hide behind it being a nation state, but for those who kind of use that as a crutch or use that as an excuse, well, this was a nation state, they're going to get in. It just doesn't sound the same if it's about Microsoft. Um, to me, it's just a matter of, yeah, they're probably going to get in. But again, if you're leaving the door wide open here, um, anybody's getting in. <laughs> it just turns out they were looking for that. And so they got in. <laughs> And, you know, Microsoft even kind of admitted uh, that, uh, you know, they've made too many decisions in favor of business, uh, you know, not wanting to be disrupted, uh, business convenience over security. And their statement, and I'm going to try to quote this here, it said, as we said late last year when we announced our secure future initiative, given the reality of threat actors that are resourced and funded by nation states, we are shifting the balance we need to strike between security and business risk. So I'm going to say that again. <laughs> given the reality of threat actors that are resourced and funded by nation states, we are shifting the balance we need to strike between security and and business risk, basically saying, hey, we know nation states are coming after us, and we know it doesn't take nation state level 
skill to get into our environment because we've been making bad business decisions uh, for our profits uh, and not enough for the security of our operations, our people, and even our company. So we've not really been ass assessing this risk right. And we've not been striking the right balance. The traditional sort of calculus is simply no longer sufficient. For Microsoft, this incident has highlighted the urgent need to move even faster. We will act immediately to apply our current security standards to Microsoft-owned legacy systems and internal business processes. So they're not even following. They're admitting. They're not even following the standards they ask everyone else to follow, um, which is pretty damning. Um, but also hey, you're admitting this to people. Um, so that's, that's, that's got a level of honor to it, a level of, uh, I won't say bravery, but there's a level of honor to whoever wrote this up and, uh, and approved this that, uh, you know, Microsoft is having to be embarrassed in front of everybody um, and is essentially admitting, yeah, we've been We've been profiting off of our uh, bad security decisions here, uh, and we're suffering now for it. Um, in this case, they didn't necessarily suffer a lot of monetary loss. Uh, they're probably not going to lose a lot of customers over this one because it didn't touch customer environments, so far as we know. Um, but it's, again, yet another breach, another very embarrassing lack of security standard application throughout the Microsoft platform. Um, and there are other up and coming platforms. Uh, well, I mean, you know, very standard and stalwart is AWS. AWS is there for everyone to use too. Uh, Google, uh, you know, is ever more challenging and finding its niche and could very well expand into areas uh, that uh, Microsoft doesn't want to excel in uh, from a security perspective. Uh, so there's Google, and I'm sure there's other platforms that would love to take a bite out of Microsoft's business model, um, simply because they're going to be the ones who don't use the traditional calculus uh, and become the more security-minded company. Um, Microsoft's made a lot of security investment from a product perspective and what they offer to the public and to commercial and uh, even Department of Defense entities. But if they're not going to apply that to themselves, hold themselves to those standards, if they're going to admit that they were just using the traditional calculus like everyone else, not recognizing that they are not like everybody else. Let me say that again. Microsoft is not like everybody else, yet they're kind of admitting here we were just kind of following the same kind of business logic everyone else uses. Um, again, when you're in the upper 0.001% you don't get to act like everybody else. You have to realize who you are and recognize your position in the market, in the society, and make sure you're acting accordingly. And at least if Microsoft is being truthful with this statement, this is at least them saying this is a wake-up call for us. And what they even say and recognize is that doing this, applying their current security standards to Microsoft-owned legacy systems and internal business processes, even when these changes might cause disruption to existing business processes, this will likely cause some level of disruption while we adapt to this new reality. This is the necessary step and only the first of several we will be taken to embrace this philosophy. What they're basically saying is, stockholders, you're going to see some chaos here. You're going to see us missing opportunities. You're going to see us simply saying no to customers. You're going to see us hopefully saying no to customers. You're going to see us uh, dropping off legacy products and systems um, that we're not going to support anymore. And that might mean we don't make as much money. I mean, Mike Microsoft already makes ridiculous, sinful amounts of money, <laughs> um, as does Apple, as does Google, as does AWS. They all make ridiculous amounts of money. Uh, so, but when you're a stockholder, you you want that dividend. <laughs> uh, so, you know that's that's it's a balance against their having to strike here, and they're telling stockholders, you know, we have to recognize who we are, and you honestly have to recognize who we are as a company and what our real position is here. Uh, and I think the savvy investor, uh, a reasonable investor is looking at this too, and they're wanting a statement like this because, again, they need to have their investment protected 
Uh, they are an owner of a company, and as an owner of a company, wouldn't you want to know that you're not going to be embarrassed uh, by <laughs> your company uh, for not doing some of the most basic and simple things in, in security, especially when you're as big as Microsoft? So, okay, this is bad news for Microsoft. This is embarrassing for Microsoft. What is... What's the glass of OJ for us? OJ, what, what, are you, what are you really getting down to? How do we come back? Um, I think this focuses, should help us focus and have a renewed conversation with uh, our stakeholders about legacy systems in our environment. You know, hey, Microsoft uh, is saying that this traditional calculus we've been working here ain't working for them. And maybe it shouldn't work for us either. Uh, and especially if you're a digital products company, you offer things like SaaS solutions or software products or other things, your development environments, your OT environments, your uh, platforms that run the data backends for things, uh, you're going to need to start giving that level of assurance and trust to customers and partners and clients uh, by reevaluating the calculus within your own firm when you decide this is a disruption we can't afford right now versus, you know what, we need to make sure a threat actor does not make this a disruption that ends up ending this company. Now, this disruption didn't end Microsoft, and there's many disruptions that your business could probably withstand, um, but I'm sure through the exact same means, this could have been a lot, lot worse had the goal of this you know, threat actor not been trying to find information about itself and actually tried to be about getting into the platform in other ways, compromising supply chain, uh, or any number of things, ransomwareing, doing other things. This could have been far worse, uh, and that should not be lost. Uh, and, and one should stop rolling the dice, probably, and begin trying to set up a plan to, you know, not just invest more in security. You know, in some of these cases, security is not necessarily the place to invest. It's really the good IT practices um, that should be uh, invested in. Being brilliant at the basics uh, is pretty important. You know, getting rid of legacy technologies, the end of life technologies in your environment uh, can be, you know, very important. Or if you can't, wrapping around and cushioning and putting proxies and and other things in front that do provide those modern levels of security in front of that, it requires more investment. It requires a lot of money and time and resources to keep propping up and, and giving those legacy systems a crutch. At what point does it just become cheaper and more cost effective and less disruptive, to be honest, to just uplift your platform, to just recode that app that's millions of lines long instead of throwing all kinds of other complexity and disruption and product in front of it to make it last another five to eight years or 10 years. Why not just go ahead and recode it so that it will last 20 years? It could be a lot of things, but we have to shake up the way we look at legacy systems. Um, and we also need to, you know, look at ourselves and say, you know, encourage yourself and other people within your business to be candid, you know, where you're not making the right calls. But, uh, what does this mean all to you? Uh, you know, what is, what kind of conversations is this making you have with executives in your company, uh, or just other people in the cybersecurity community? Be interested in your thoughts, leave them down in the comments, find me on social media, and I will see you in the next one. Thank you.